going to ask you please to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And the 11th verse says again, And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now this morning we come to consider the third office that's listed in this 11th verse. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died as a substitute for sinners on a cross, was raised from the dead bodily, ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and having completed all of His redemptive work, He then gave gifts to men. Sending His Spirit, the birthing of the church, He gave spiritual gifts. He gave gifts to believers individually. Then He gave some gifts to the church as a whole in the form of gifted men. He gave offices to the church. He gave apostles. He gave prophets. He gave evangelists. He gave pastors, pastor-teachers. And we've seen that some of these offices and some of these gifts that were used to function in these offices have since passed off the scene. God gave them for the founding of the church, for the early years of the church. And having accomplished all that they were meant to accomplish, God faded them out. They went away. There are no longer apostles. We've seen that if you've been here the last few weeks. No longer apostles being given today. There are no prophets being given today. The gift of prophecy, uh, as the prophets exercised it, is no longer functioning. The various sign gifts that were exercised by the apostles, they're no longer functioning. Um, they were for a purpose and for a time. God is finished with them. And what God is giving for certain are pastor teachers and the other office in the church would be that of deacon. What about this office of evangelist? What do we know about it? We've got to ask the same kind of questions about the evangelist. What exactly were evangelists in the first century? What was their ministry? Is God still giving evangelists? Is this still a valid office in the New Testament church? These are the questions we have to ask. And this morning, as we consider it, let me give you three things we're going to see together. Number one, we're going to look at the New Testament references to evangelists. Where are they mentioned and what does the Bible say about them? Second, we're going to see the biblical ministry of those evangelists. What exactly was their ministry in the first century? And if the office is still valid today, what is the ministry of an evangelist today? And then third, we're going to talk about the importance of the ministry of evangelism today. The importance of the ministry of evangelism. Now, we begin this morning with the New Testament references to evangelists. And it may surprise you, because this office is mentioned along with apostles and prophets and pastors, it may surprise you how little the Bible has to say about the evangelist. The Bible has many references to apostles, many references to prophets, many references to pastors. But the Bible doesn't say much about evangelists. In fact, not counting this one or counting this one, there are only two other references to evangelists in the rest of the New Testament. Only three total. For example, in Acts chapter 21, Philip was called an evangelist. Acts 21 verse 8 and on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, 
we stayed with him. And so there Philip is called an evangelist. I want you to look at the other reference. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, because it's important as we understand this office this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and outside of Ephesians 4.11 and Acts 21.8, this is the only other place where the evangelist is referred to. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 5. Paul says to the young minister Timothy, he says, But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now notice there, it does not say that Timothy was an evangelist, but rather he was to do the work of an evangelist. And the way this verse is commonly taken is that Timothy should be looked upon as a pastor and the ministry, he was being reminded, is, is to be well-rounded. And so he was to also do the work of an evangelist. I want to say that as I've looked at that this week and as I've thought through all the material available to us, I, I believe we ought to take this verse in another sense. I think we should think of Timothy as an evangelist. That that was, in fact, his ministry. And what the Apostle Paul was saying to, the, to him was this, do your work. Do the work of an evangelist. And that's why he follows it with, fulfill your ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. If someone said to me today, Richard, do the work of a pastor. Fulfill your ministry. I would know exactly what they mean. God called me to be a pastor. This is the work I'm engaged in. Now do the work of a pastor. And fulfill that ministry. I believe that Paul addressed Timothy in the role, in the ministry of an evangelist. And he was saying, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I'm not alone in that perspective. John Calvin also understood the verse that way and others at least acknowledge that it's possible to take the verse that way. And I think if you just read it naturally, it makes perfect sense. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. These are the only references we have to evangelists in the New Testament. Now, there's someone else that I think we should take to be an evangelist, even though the word is never used in reference to it. And that's Titus. I believe that just like Timothy served as an evangelist, I believe Titus also served as an evangelist. And we're going to see more of why I say that when we look at the biblical ministry of evangelists. But right away, something you notice as you study Paul's letters to Timothy and to Titus they had a role in ministry and they had responsibilities in ministry that went far beyond that of the average pastor. When Paul sent Timothy into a place, he was Paul's personal representative. And when Paul wrote Titus, he tells him in chapter 1, verse 5 of the book of Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now, that goes far beyond the ministry of the average pastor. A pastor or elders have a voice in terms of who serves as a pastor in that local congregation. But there's no pastor who has the authority to go, to about, go about in all the cities where there are churches and appoint elders. That went beyond the ministry of the average pastor. And so I would say it's best to understand Timothy and Titus as serving in the role of an evangelist. Now, I think you'll understand this better when we come to the second thought this morning. First of all, those are the New Testament references to evangelists. That's all we have on evangelists. Here's the second thought this morning. What exactly was their ministry? What was the biblical ministry of evangelists? And a few things emerged. First of all, they assisted the apostles. There was a definite connection between this office and the apostles. We know that Philip was an evangelist. And when you look at Acts chapter 8, you see that Philip was preaching the gospel in Samaria. He had gone ahead of the apostles there. And he was preaching the gospel and there were people being saved and being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But notice that after he had preached the gospel and people had been saved and baptized, the apostles came in behind him. Look at Acts chapter 8, look at verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ... They were being baptized, men and women alike, and even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip 
And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. You notice that Philip also has the ability to do signs and wonders by the Spirit of God. Why? Because he was working in close association with the apostles. It was an apostolic ministry even though he was not an apostle. It was an an apostolic um, ministry in terms of its authority and in terms of God bearing witness to it. Now notice what else happens. Verse 14, Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, this was a unique time in church history. There was a transition going on from Old Covenant to New Covenant in terms of God's assembly. And so what you have here is you have the Lord sovereignly withholding the giving of His Spirit until the apostles could arrive at the place where Philip the Evangelist had been preaching the gospel. Now this no longer takes place, beloved. The New Testament epistles are clear that the moment a person receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, at that moment, the Spirit of God comes to indwell that person. But for a time, as the gospel was spreading, as doors were being opened to new frontiers for the gospel, what would happen is evangelists would go ahead of the apostles, they would preach the gospel, people were saved, they were baptized, and in this case, the apostles came in behind them, and then the Lord authenticated it all by giving His Spirit through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. You find, if you look at Timothy and Titus and consider them to be evangelists, you find that it also worked in the opposite way. The apostles would go into an area, they would preach the gospel, people would be saved, they would receive the Spirit, they would be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The evangelists would come in behind them and go on sharing the gospel. People were being saved. These young churches were being established. And these evangelists would then teach sound doctrine, as he says to Titus, set the things in order that remain. Churches would be set in order and elders would be appointed. And so you had the evangelists going ahead of the apostles and the apostles coming behind. You had the apostles going ahead of the evangelists and the evangelists coming behind. Working hand in hand. They assisted the apostles. They were also appointed by the apostles, as you see in the case of Timothy and Titus. There's something else we can say about the evangelists. Not only did they assist the apostles, they were gifted by the Lord for this work, for the work of evangelism. Look back in Ephesians 4 with me, please. Ephesians 4.11. Each of the offices mentioned in Ephesians 4.11 required a special giftedness. The apostles had a special giftedness to carry out their work. We've already seen that. The prophets had a special giftedness to carry out their ministry. We know that pastor teachers today have a special giftedness by God to carry out their ministry. The same was true in the case of the evangelists. They were specially gifted to serve in this role of ministry. You say, well, what was their giftedness? Well, several things we can see worked into it. They had an ability to preach and to explain the gospel with an unction and an authority from God. That's one of the things we see. As you look at, Philipp, at, at, at Acts, rather, I'm thinking about Philip. As you look at Acts chapter 8 and you look at Philip, you can see that he preached the gospel. He explained the gospel with a special unction and authority from God. Not only did he preach the gospel publicly, but you go further in Acts chapter 8. He's preached it publicly in Samaria. You go further on and there he is meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch one-on-one and sharing the gospel with that man one-on-one. And so they had a special ability from God to preach and to explain the gospel message. As a result of that giftedness, they were also used by God to reap souls. As Philip went about preaching the gospel, people were saved. They came to Christ. They were baptized. They followed the Lord. God was using them to reap souls. And then as we see Timothy and Titus, we see an ability to plant churches or oversee churches to give them a solid doctrinal foundation to set things in order. Let me tell you, if you don't get anything else out of the sermon this morning, you need to get this. The New Testament evangelist was not a guy with ten suits and ten sermons. He was not a guy who went about from church to church and he had his thing down, he had his routine down, he had his sermons down, and he did his thing, 
And that was not the New Testament evangelist. There is Philip. A eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah in a chariot and he's able to take him right where he's reading from, right from the book of Isaiah and take him to Jesus. And in the case of Timothy and Titus, they were able to guard sound doctrine and establish young believers in the faith. And so these were men who had a solid doctrinal foundation. They, they served along with the apostles. They understood the Word of God. These were not traveling shows. They were men who had a depth to their ministry. And so uh, they were gifted for their task. Something else we can say is we just mentioned they used their gift both in public proclamation and in private witness. Philip was there preaching the gospel publicly in Samaria. Later on, he's sharing one on one. Now, the question we have to ask is does this office still exist? Is God still giving evangelists to his churches? And I've got to tell you, some solid teachers say yes, and some solid teachers say no. An example of a solid teacher who says no is Martin Lloyd-Jones. Listen to what he had to say about this. Quote, If any are surprised that I place the evangelist and his office in the same extraordinary and temporary category as the apostles and prophets, the probability is that they are thinking of an evangelist in terms of the modern use of the term now, let me just insert this thought. Lloyd-Jones did not deny, nor would I, that God has gifted men for itinerant preaching ministries. Nor would he have denied that God has gifted people to serve as missionaries, church planters, on and on. There was no denial of that. The question is, are they evangelists? In the sense of the New Testament word, he goes on to say this, this does not mean that, they are, that there may not be men since then and in the church today who are given a special call to preach the gospel in a particular way and manner. But strictly speaking, they are not evangelists in the New Testament sense of the word. It would be better to call them exhorters, as they were called at the time of the evangelical awakening of the 18th century. And then there are other men who say, no, the, the gifts still exist, or the office rather still exists, John MacArthur being among those. I've got to tell you that as I've looked at the material this week, I believe in my heart that the office has ceased. I don't believe that God is giving evangelists today in the New Testament sense of the word. I do believe, however, that the gift goes on. There are people who are especially gifted in the area of evangelism. The ministry of evangelism goes on, but I believe the office has ceased. That there are no evangelists today in the sense of Ephesians 4.11. Pastor, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Let me give you several reasons. First of all, this was an office given to the church. In Ephesians 4.11, he's not describing simply individual giftedness. He's talking about church offices. Underline that in your mind. Church offices. And if God is giving these offices in Ephesians 4.11 in the order of their authority, and I believe that He is, you'll notice the apostles are listed first. Why? Because they had supreme authority in the first century church. The prophets are listed second. Why? 1 Corinthians 12, 28 tells us they were second in authority. Evangelists are listed third, and then pastors are listed last. And if God is listing these offices in their order of authority, then the evangelist had authority over pastors, superior to pastors in the first century church. And if you stop and think about it, if indeed Timothy and Titus were evangelists, you can see that clearly. Because Paul was able to send Timothy into these churches and there he was able, along with Titus, to set things in order. And in some cases, to appoint elders. It was an office given to the church. Some, one example of how Timothy was a representative for Paul is found in Philippians 2.19. It says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition... For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. He said, I'm going to send Timothy to you because he's the only one that represents me. I mean, really has a heart for you like I do. That's what he said. And so, uh, first of all, I would say it was a church office, not just a gift. Second reason, though, I would list is this seems to be in a way for God to transition from the apostles to the pastors in local church settings. It was sort of an intermediate office. John Calvin recognized this. He wrote this, quote, It is not clear, talking about now 2 Timothy 4, 5, 
where Paul told Timothy to do, do the work of an evangelist, he says it is not clear whether this word has a general meaning and denotes all ministers of the gospel or whether it prescribes some special office. I am more inclined to the second view since it is clear from Ephesians 4.11 that there was an intermediate order of ministry between apostles and the pastors so that evangelists were assistants second to the apostles. And I agree with John Calvin. I see apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. And so evangelists were a step from apostles to pastors in local church settings. Let me give you a third reason though. It's a church office. That's not like what we're seeing practiced today in the name of evangelist. It was a church office. Second, a way to transition from the apostles to the pastors. Here's the third thing I see. The New Testament gives us no qualifications for the continuation of the office. Now stop and think about it. You have qualifications given for the selection of pastors. And you have qualifications given for the selection of deacons. Where are the qualifications given for the selection of apostles? There aren't any. Why not? Jesus Christ chose them personally. And once their office, their work was complete, the office ceased. No need for continuing qualifications for the church to select apostles. There are no apostles today. The office ceased. Where are the qualifications for prophets? There aren't any listed even though they had a function in the local church in the first century, there are no qualifications listed. Why not? Because the prophets were subject to the authority of the apostles and they were subject to one another. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. They were subject to one another. Once the apostles and the prophets were no longer needed, the office passed off the scene. Therefore, no need for continuing qualifications. There are no prophets today. No way to select them. No way to know if they're qualified because there aren't any. Now, why are there no qualifications for evangelists? Because they were personally chosen by the apostles, worked in conjunction with the apostles. It was an intermediate office between apostles, prophets, and pastors. And once the foundation of the church was laid, churches were established. We had the New Testament canon with qualifications given for elders... So that the evangelist didn't have to go through and just personally appoint them. The qualifications are laid down. Now there's no longer any need for evangelists. That's why you have no qualification because the office has ceased to go on. The office has ceased. Now, that raises a question. Pastor, what do you say about itinerant preaching ministries? What do you say about the, the men who go about and preach in churches? And what would you say about missionaries and what would you say about church planters? I would say what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. I believe God does give some men to go about and preach in more than one place and they're not stationed simply in one church. I believe that God has gifted people in such a way they serve as missionaries and church planters. But if we understand it this way, do you know what this emphasizes? All ministry today must go forth from where? The local New Testament church. And so those men who go out to preach the gospel, those people who go out to serve as missionaries, those people who go out to serve as church planters, they have already come under the authority and the discernment of elders. And they are approved by the churches before they go out to serve in these ministries. And I believe that's exactly how God ordained it. When evangelists were chosen, there were apostles. Well, first of all, when apostles were chosen, Jesus did it. When prophets came on the scene, they were subject to the apostles. When evangelists came on the scene, they were subject to the apostles. When the apostles went away and the prophets went away, the evangelists went away, and now we're left with elders. And those who go out from the church to preach the gospel or serve as missionaries or serve as church planters, they will have come out, should have come out of the local church. They have been subject to the authority and the discernment of elders. That's how they're selected today. And so I would say that this office, a church office, working in close association with the apostles in the foundation of the church, it has ceased. But now, and here's the third point this morning where I really want us to focus in. Because you'll have missed the message if you miss this. Even though the evangelist is only mentioned three times in the New Testament, did you know that the ministry of evangelism is mentioned at least 130 times? 
Three times God mentions the evangelist. Fifty-four times the verb translated to preach the gospel is found in the New Testament. Seventy-six times the noun translated gospel is found in the New Testament. So three times he talks about the evangelist. One hundred and thirty times, though, he talks about evangelism. And so if I were to ask you this morning, where does God place His greatest emphasis? On the evangelist or on evangelism? What would you say? On evangelism. And why did He do it that way? Why such a a little portion of the Word of God given to evangelists? Because God is making clear to us from the very outset that the ministry of evangelism was never the sole responsibility of an office. Never the sole responsibility of an office. The ministry of evangelism is the responsibility of every Christian. It is the privilege and the responsibility of every Christian. And so we've got to ask some important questions this morning. First of all, what is evangelism? God has put an emphasis on the ministry of evangelism. What is evangelism? And mark this down in your thinking. I'm going to define it negatively first, but get this. Evangelism is not securing conversions. Evangelism is not securing conversions. That is, evangelism is not the result. Evangelism is what leads to the result. Evangelism is preaching the gospel, plain and simple. And whenever we preach the gospel or declare the gospel publicly or individually, that is evangelism. Conversion is God's work. I'll say it to you this simply. Evangelism is what God has called us to do. Conversion is what only God can do. And so evangelism is sharing the message, sharing the gospel. And this is so important that we don't equate those two things in our minds. Because if we think that evangelism is securing the response Number one, we're not going to really understand what the ministry is. Number two, we're going to rob God in our own minds. It's the only place you could ever rob Him. But in our own minds of His glory. Listen for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says this, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in His triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one an aroma from death to death to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? He says, wherever the people of God go throughout the world, God is diffusing through them the aroma of His Son. And to some, it is a turnoff To others, it leads them into His kingdom. To some, it is from death to death. To the others, it is from life to life. He says, who is adequate for these things. Now, can you see in those verses that God is glorified in more than one way? He is glorified in His people when people are saved, yes, but He is no less glorified in His people when people reject the gospel. Because in both instances, what is He doing? He is diffusing the aroma of His Son through His people. That glorifies God. All of us have the responsibility and the privilege to go throughout this world, wherever God has planted us, wherever we're living our lives, and through us, God declares His gospel message. We have that privilege. We have that responsibility. We must be doing it constantly. We must let our light shine at all times. People say, um, Pastor, what do you want to see in the ministry of evangelism? What would be successful in the ministry of evangelism? Well, let me tell you what it is. It's real simple. When we as a church understand that evangelism is declaring the gospel message, when we understand that it's all of our privilege and responsibility, and when we see it is a a a seven-day-a-week responsibility, that's when we we will have understood the New Testament's message about evangelism. Will we be successful if we have 60 people here on Tuesday night? Evangelism is not a Tuesday night activity. Evangelism is not the responsibility of a single ministry. Evangelism is not the responsibility of a single person. Evangelism is the responsibility of every Christian in this place all the time, every day. It's a lifestyle. It's making the message known. And if we ever think that it's our job to secure the responses, to secure conversions, 
We're going to, we're going to find ourselves dumbing down the message, man, trying to manipulate people, and ultimately we will be guilty of contributing to the deception of souls. J.I. Packer in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, has some tremendous observations. And in his chapter on evangelism, he identifies an area of great confusion in the church of our day. He said this, quote, "...it is our widespread and persistent habit of defining evangelism in terms not of a message delivered, but of an effect produced in our hearers." He's exactly right. If I were to ask the average Baptist today, the average Christian today, how would you define an evangelistic church? What would you say? What is an evangelistic church? And you know what most people would say? They would say an evangelistic church is a church that has a lot of decisions. A church that has a lot of baptisms. I guarantee that's what they would say. And the reason why is we have confused in our minds what evangelism is. Evangelism is the delivery of the message. It is not securing the responses. Some, someone might say, well, you know, oh, so-and-so church, they had 200 baptisms last year. They were an evangelistic church. And I want to ask, okay, what message were they sharing? Do we know? Do we know? Do we really know what effect that message had on those 200 people? Are there fruits of genuine conversion in their lives? Are they people who are truly committed to Jesus Christ? Are they people who really love their husbands and wives and children? Are they people who really seek to know the Word of God and walk in the Word of God? Are, are they continuing in the faith? Are they maturing as a believer? And perhaps most importantly, does anybody care? Does anyone care? Or are we satisfied to write down our statistics and take our awards? I'll say it again. Evangelism is what we have been called to do. Conversion is what God and God alone can do. And so what is an evangelistic church? An evangelistic church is a church that faithfully proclaims the gospel message. That's an evangelistic church. But now we've got to understand the declaring of the message right also. When we say declaring the message, we, you know, we've got to understand what that means. And let me say it to you this way. To declare the gospel message, to, to, to evangelize, is to declare the gospel message clearly what it means to, to know who Jesus Christ is, to know Him as Savior and Lord, to declare that message clearly, to declare it depending upon the Lord. We're not evangelizing if we're simply reciting facts and there's no dependence upon the Lord. Evangelism is a ministry. It requires the work of the Holy Spirit. So we declare the message depending upon the Lord and now listen, and we have a clear aim in that message. We have a clear goal in that message. And the goal is to issue a summons from God. God calls upon these people whom we preach and teach to, God calls upon them to repent of their sins and to place their faith in His Son. We are not evangelizing if we simply give the facts, but we never call someone, never summon someone to repentance and faith. Evangelism is to share the message and then call upon them as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to repent of their sins and to put their trust in the living Lord. That's evangelism. And it's all of our responsibility. J.I. Packer says later, quote, according to the New Testament, evangelism is just preaching the gospel, the evangel. It is a work of communication in which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for God's message of mercy to sinners. Anyone who faithfully delivers that message under whatever circumstances, in a large meeting, in a small meeting, from a pulpit, or in a private conversation, is evangelizing. Since the divine message finds its climax in a plea from the Creator to a rebel world to turn and put faith in Christ, the delivering of it involves the summoning of one's hearers to conversion. If you are not, in this sense, seeking to bring about conversions, you are not evangelizing. The way to tell whether in fact you're evangelizing is not to ask whether conversions are known to have resulted from your witness. 
It is to ask whether you are faithfully making known the gospel message. Do you get that? Are you faithfully making known the gospel message? Are you calling men and women to repentance and faith in Christ? And may the Lord help us to see that the gospel that we have in this book, the gospel, do you understand that God has given that to us as a treasure? He's put it in earthen vessels. He's put it into our hands in the form of the Scriptures. And do you realize, beloved, that we have the joyful privilege of declaring that message? Yes, but we also have an awesome responsibility that has been conveyed to us by the very fact God gave it to us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... So we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. 1 Timothy 1.11 According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. 1 Corinthians 9.16 For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, this message has been entrusted to me. God has approved me by giving it to me. And now, woe is me if I don't declare it. And every saved person in this place, you've been saved by the grace of God because you heard the good news about Jesus Christ. And in exercising faith in Christ, God Himself came to live in you. And you have the Gospel now housed in you as a treasure. And you have a responsibility to share that message with men and women all around your life. And woe is unto all of us if we don't do it. Woe be unto us. Now that leads to another thought. What is the message we're to share? What is the message of evangelism? What is the gospel? We use that word, we're to share the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel in the largest sense of the word, beloved, is everything that's been revealed about Jesus of Nazareth. Everything that's been revealed about Jesus, that's the gospel. That's why, do you know what we do here every Sunday, though we preach to the church predominantly? Do you know what we're doing? We're declaring the gospel. If you teach the whole counsel of God, you're declaring the gospel. Because the gospel is everything God has revealed about Jesus of Nazareth. It's news of the incarnation. It's news of the atonement. It's news of the kingdom. As one writer said, the cradle, the cross, and the crown of the Son of God. That's the gospel. The cradle, the cross, and the crown of the Son of God. It involves learning. It's one of the things we've got to examine when we think about evangelism today. It's not simply saying, Jesus died on a cross, now will you pray the prayer? That's not evangelism. We've got to ask, who is this Jesus who died on the cross? What does the Bible reveal about Him? And so we teach them that He is the second person of the triune Godhead, that He is eternal God who was born into this world, formed in His mother's womb, a virgin, formed in that womb by the Spirit of God, no earthly father. Born of a virgin, we've got to teach people that He lived a perfect life. That that, in fact, qualified Him to do what He did on the cross. And on the cross, He was dying as a substitute. I mean, actually dying in the place and the stead of sinners who stood guilty before God. And that after having died on that cross and pouring out His life's blood to pay for all the sins of all those who will ever believe Him, He was raised from the dead bodily. God the Father had accepted His offering. His work indeed is sufficient. He is indeed who He claimed to be. He conquered hell, death, the grave, and Satan. And then He ascended to the right hand of the Majesty on high, and sat down in heaven because all His work was finished. And that same Jesus then sent His Spirit and has given His Gospel, sent us out with His authority and His presence to declare to the whole world that He's the only way to the Father. That He's the only way to be forgiven. He's the only way for your sins to be washed away. He's the only way to be reconciled to a holy God who pronounced you guilty by virtue of your sin. And that salvation comes when you turn 
from your sinful ways, your sinful thoughts, your sinful choices, and you turn to Jesus Christ as Lord who saves. That you come to Him as your Master and your King, your God as well as your Savior, and you submit your life to Him, no strings attached. You lose your life to gain His. We've got to tell them about the Son of God. We've got to tell them who He is. It's not just Jesus down on the cross who want to pray a prayer. Who is this Jesus? What did the cross mean, you see? And I'm convinced we're living in a day where, yeah, we have 200 baptisms and 200 decisions, but how many people really know Jesus, you see? That's the question. J.I. Packer said in another place, quote, it was a message of some complexity needing to be learned before it could be lived by and understood before it could be applied. It needed, therefore, to be taught. Hence, Paul, as a preacher of it, had to become a teacher. And it's interesting, when you read the book of Acts and you see how Luke describes Paul's evangelism ministry, he uses words like reasoned. He reasoned with them. He disputed with them. He taught them. He persuaded them. He was a teacher. People say it sometimes, you know, I think you're kind of a teacher instead of a preacher. And I want to say, what do you think preaching is? Preaching, beloved, is teaching and exhorting. It's teaching and calling people to obey. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Paul writes, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, His prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light, listen, through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. He says, I preach it and I teach it. Colossians 1.28, he says, And we proclaim Him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. You read the book of Acts, it was not uncommon for Paul to go to a city, go to the synagogue, and for weeks to instruct there, to teach there. And then people would place their faith in Christ. What is the message of evangelism? It's all the truth about Jesus of Nazareth. But we can say this, if we're preaching and teaching in order for someone to be converted, there are four essential ingredients in our message. I want you to write these down. Four essential ingredients when we're ministering for the conversion of a sinner. Four things must be there. First of all, If we're preaching the gospel, it is a message about God. We must begin with who God is. Who is He? Who is God? We must tell people that God is holy. That God is one. There's only one true God in this universe. He has eternally existed as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is the Creator. We are the created. And He is the lawgiver. And His standards are the standards for the universe. And whoever has violated His law stands guilty before Him and is deserving of the penalty of death. But that the same holy and just God who will by no means clear the guilty, just excuse their sins, the same holy God is also loving and gracious and merciful and has made a way for sinful people like us to be saved. Number one, it's a message about God. Number two, it's a message about sin. If we don't, if we don't get this, we'll never be effective in evangelism. Listen, nobody gets saved until they know they're lost. Nobody knows they need to be forgiven until they know they're guilty. And to simply offer Jesus as a psychological salve for the loneliness you feel or the emptiness you feel and never explain why people are lonely and empty and miserable is to contribute to someone falling short of true faith in Christ. You can't be saved if you don't know you're lost. You can't be forgiven if you don't know you're guilty. It's a message about sin. 
must tell people that God's standard is perfection. We must tell people that's why it's impossible for anyone to be saved by their works. We must tell people that we have fallen short of God's standard. We have become guilty, filthy, helpless in sin. And now, born into this world, we all stood under the wrath of that almighty, holy, perfect God. It's a message about sin. And we must also tell people that there's a specific way and only one way that that sin could ever be atoned for, could ever be paid for, could ever be washed away. Which leads to a third thing. If we're preaching the Gospel, it's a message about Jesus Christ in His saving work. Now, this is very important. And I hope I can explain it well. Lord, help me. But I hope you'll get this. One of the things that that I have seen personally wrong in evangelism efforts is that we present salvation as if it's a plan. There is a plan here. But we present it as if it's an insurance policy. We explain all the facts about it and how it all works. And then we say, now you, you want to sign up? You want to pray? Beloved, people are saved by a person, not a plan. Faith in a person. The, though you can't see Him, the resurrected Son of God saves. Jesus saves. You know Him by faith, but He saves. I'll say it to you this morning this way. If you don't know Jesus, you're not a Christian. If you've never met Jesus Christ, by faith, you're not a Christian. But now listen, here's the other part of it. There's one side. If you can keep that over there on that side of your brain. Here's the other mistake people make. They want to talk about Jesus saving, but they don't want to relate Jesus to His saving work. To His death on the cross. What that cross meant. His resurrection. What that resurrection meant. His incarnation. What the incarnation meant. And here's, here's where you put these things together. Jesus saves, but He never saves apart from His redemptive work. When He forgives your sins, how are your sins forgiven? Because of a real death on a cross. And when you stand accepted by the Father in righteousness, where did that righteousness come from? From 33 years of perfect living by the Son of God on this earth. So that His death pays for your sins and His life is imputed to your account for your righteousness before God. Jesus does it. I look to Christ, but He does it by virtue of of the work, the redemptive work He accomplished in time and history. And so evangelism is a message about Christ in His saving work. So we tell them about God and we tell them about sin, about us, sinners. We tell them about Jesus. And here's the fourth part of the message. It is a summons to repentance and faith. You see, then comes the question, what will you do with this Jesus? Will you repent? The word repentance means a change of mind and heart. It's like I'm headed down a road this way and God opens my eyes to see who Jesus is and what He did for sinners like me. But in order to receive Christ, I must turn. From my thoughts about God, my thoughts about how to get to heaven, my thoughts about how I ought to live life, my thoughts about holding on to my life and living life my way, I must be willing to turn and without reservation give my life to the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Trusting His death for the forgiveness of my sins, trusting His merit for my acceptance with God, trusting Him with my life from this day forward and for the rest of eternity. That is repentance. Trust in Christ is faith. And it's not just from your head because you can believe all the facts I've shared this morning and go to hell. It is a trust from your heart. It is a relinquishing of one's life. Jesus said if any man seeks to save his life, he'll what? Lose it. But if he will lose his life for my sake, he'll what? Find it. And we have preached the gospel only when we've told people how to be saved, yes, but then issue 
the summons that really comes from the Creator to a rebel world. Will you repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ? Are there any evangelists today? In the sense of Timothy and Titus and the New Testament evangelists? No. But is there a ministry of evangelism today? Yes. Whose ministry is it? Beloved, whose ministry is it? All of us. All of us. Tuesday nights? Or all the time? What's an evangelistic church? Do you measure that by the results? No, because whose job is conversion? You measure it by are we faithfully, dependently, urgently, making the gospel known? And beloved, when we have God's heart about this, let me tell you something. We will care. The Bible uses words like exhort, plead, and yes, it even uses the word beg. If we can share the gospel and someone walks away and our heart is not heavy, something's wrong. Exhort, plead, beg. But who can take a sinful heart, darkened, hating God, and enlighten it? Enlighten the man's inner man. So he sees the glory of God in the face of Jesus and wants the Son of God. If it cost him father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, yea, even his own life, he wants Jesus. Who can do that? God. With men it's impossible. But praise God, with God all things are possible. Let's bow our heads together, please. Let me ask first, have you repented and put your faith in Christ? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you looked to Him for the forgiveness of your sins, for a righteousness that is not your own? Have you given Him your life that you might have His? If you can't honestly say yes, would you do that now? Would you call out to Him right now? I exhort you. I plead with you. I beg you. To call to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him to save you. And then unashamedly confess Him before men as the Lord who has saved you. And to every believer in this place, how are we doing in the area of evangelism? Are we declaring the gospel clearly? Are we teaching it? Are we explaining it? Boldly? And are we actually doing what the whole message is meant to do? Are we summoning men and women to repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ? Father in Heaven, help us to be that evangelistic church that would please You. Help us individually, Lord, to take seriously this great responsibility You gave us when You gave us the Gospel. And Lord, I pray for anyone in this building who has yet to place their faith in Christ. Lord, may You grant them life even this moment. And may they call out to Jesus. We ask You this in Jesus' name. Amen.